throughout. Anyway, moving on. Um, we do want to hear from you, the audience, throughout the after the panel, and we ask that you ask questions at the end. Apparently, there's a raise your hand icon uh, somewhere on your Zoom um, controls. They can do that uh, to ask questions at the end of the panel. Just to let you know, the idea for this panel came about last year from my co-moderator, Pooja, who thought it'd be a great idea to team up with InSoul, and a number of us were intending to obviously go to the conference in Cape Town, unfortunately, which we were all disappointed uh, had to be cancelled, obviously, for obvious reasons in March. Rather than let the um, opportunity go to waste, I work in InSoul made it possible, and here we are by power of Zoom today. Moving on, some introductions. For those of you that don't know, I work, our sponsor, Zoom Host, stands for the International Women's Insolvency and Restructuring Confederation. It was set up in 1994 and spans the globe. It is the premier global networking organisation with over 1,500 members and is dedicated to promoting women in insolvency and restructuring through networking. Thank you for supporting us today. I'd also like to thank Insol. Now for panel introductions. My name is Mia Drenner. I am the co-founder and group president of Glass. Our firm is the leading independent agency firm which specializes in complex restructuring situations. I am also the European Networks Director for iWork. Moving on, I'd like to introduce you to my co-moderator, Puha Sinha. Pooja is a partner at GLAS Law, an international new age law firm. I'm not quite sure what that means, Pooja, but based in Singapore. Pooja is a corporate finance lawyer with extensive cross-border restructuring experience. She is iWorks Asia Networks Director, a member of iWorks UC Trial Committee and InSol's Technical Research Committee. Moving on to Japan. Yuri Sagano is a partner at Nishimura and Asahi in its restructuring and insolvency practice, as well as serving co-leader of its labour law practice in Tokyo. She is the co-chair of the Japan Network at iWork and has been for the past three and a half years. Moving on to the UK, Sonia van der Graaf is a partner at Morrison and Forrester in London. Her practice focuses on cross-border insolvencies and restructuring devises advising creditors, debtors, and boards of directors. Moving on to Cayman, Rebecca Hume is a partner in Cobra and Kim in Cayman. She specializes in cross-border insolvency, litigation, international judgment enforcement, fraud and asset tracing, and complex commercial disputes with particular emphasis on private equity hedge funds and joint venture and partnership disputes. Her practice covers both offshore and onshore regions, and she represents shareholders and other stakeholders in cross-border restructurings, both solvent and insolvent liquidations. Kathleen Wong is a banking partner at Allen Overy and based in Johannesburg in South Africa. She advises lenders and borrowers on a wide range of international banking and finance transactions, including syndicated loan project finance, acquisition finance and debt restructuring. She has extensive banking and finance experience in developed and emerging markets, having worked in Europe, Asia, and Africa. Catherine is, is rated as highly regarded in banking and project finance by IFLR. Smith and Menon is a Singapore lawyer with Wong Partnership. She serves on the Singapore iWork Board and the International Chamber of Commerce. Her practice covers both restructuring and arbitration mandates, which are mostly cross-border in nature, given Singapore's efforts to become an Asian centre for dispute resolution and restructuring. Without further ado, let me hand over to Pooja to start the first theme of the panel. Thank you, Mia. Um, now, while I work for a new age firm, it's not new age enough to fix my virtual background, so we'll just have to go with my boring wall instead. <laughs> Um, right, so I just wanted to start with some background on the topic. Uh, you know, why do we think that the topic is relevant today? Um, now, this might sound a little bit grandma-esque, uh, but if you ask any experienced practitioner for career advice, uh, I'm willing to bet that everybody will say the same thing. What really matters in your professional success 
is not you know the fancy degrees or how good how well you did at uni but it's all going to come down to these intangible unquantifiable soft skills that you deploy in your career and debt restructuring deals are a perfect example of that uh, because by definition each deal is bespoke which is just a polite word for messy and involves dealing with multiple stakeholders so that's when appreciating and navigating cultural considerations to get the deal across the line becomes particularly important um, there's also some other reasons why this topic is particularly relevant as of day living as we are in the covid world there is going to be an increase in cross border debt restructurings in due course and this is obviously exactly the kind of debt restructuring where cultural considerations come to the fore over and above that the topic of culture and cultural differences has actually become a very polarized one in today's global economy given the geopolitical uh, circumstances that we're operating in we've got the world's biggest superpowers who are culturally distinct in themselves um, engaged in a battle for political and economic dominance across the globe and not scared to deploy everything from the checkbook to the power of the legal regime to do so so those broader dynamics are going to play out even more in the restructuring landscape as well so with that let's move to panel theme 1 which is to explore what do we mean by cultural considerations now forging a common definition is a bit like trying to agree on what is the role of secured versus unsecured creditors in a debt restructuring it's very difficult to actually reach a common consensus if it if it's even possible to do so at all so for the purpose of the panel i wanted to set the stage and focus on three key themes that we'll be picking up as we go along the first theme is what is the cultural dna underpinning the restructuring and insolvency regime in each jurisdiction that we focus on is it debtor friendly or is it cult or, or is it creditor friendly as a related point what is the cultural perception around the restructuring and insolvency process is there a stigma around it or is it just seen as an opportunity to undertake a fresh start the second important theme that we will touch upon is what is the cultural mindset of the stakeholders and how does this affect uh, deal outcomes and this plays out both in the public sphere and the private sphere now in the public sphere we see increasingly a trend of national governments to get involved in different ways in debt restructurings either directly or indirectly through regulators and courts now there's increasingly a trend to take action to either protect uh, what is seen as a public asset be it an soe or a private company which is owning a so-called public asset or to protect certain vulnerable classes of domestic creditors such as retail um, investors or indeed even domestic banks and of course there's always the question of local employees in the private sphere it comes down to the differing cultural mindsets of both the organizations per se but also the individuals representing the organization in that specific deal um, now how organizations think is obviously driven by a number of different factors and obviously there's some prevailing stereotypes around that as well and we'll partially touch upon stereotypes on this panel as well we all know the stereotype of the you know supposed short-termist value focused u.s distressed debt investor and on the other hand we also know the stereotype of asian and african family-owned businesses where business deals are built over handshakes and cups of tea or other strong beverages over many years rather than sitting across the table and signing on the dotted line and finally time permitting we will also explore our own cultural mindset as deal practitioners and how this can have an impact on the deal outcome and this includes not just understanding and appreciating our own cultural identity and the cultural identity of stakeholders but it's also the a function of the implicit and explicit biases of the ecosystem that we operate in now we're very privileged here to have a truly cross continental uh, panel to discuss these very important issues we have all but two continents represented uh, in one continent that we won't cover the primary residents are scientists and penguins and luckily debt restructuring isn't quite an issue there yet so i think it's fair to say that we have a truly global representation here today so i would then turn to each of the panelists for a local perspective from their national and their regional context to two of the themes that I just covered. As a recap, 
what is the cultural DNA of the RNI regime? Is it debtor friendly or creditor friendly? And what is the perception of being in a restructuring and insolvency process? And the second theme, how have cultural considerations played out among stakeholders? So I'll start with Sonia, who has a unique perspective, obviously sitting at the center of the common law world, so to speak, in London, and obviously at the front and center of many cross-border deals as well. Thank you, Preeta. Yes, uh, sitting at the center of uh, the, the common law world in, here in London, um, Americans might um, cavil with that. So I'm, I'm going to take a little step back and have a, a look at uh, the history of, of what informs our, our um, bankruptcy law DNA. And I think it's really interesting to have a look at the stark contrast between the treatment of bankrupts historically as between the US and the UK. You look back to Dickens novels and the way in which he represents the, the grim world of the debtor's prison and how in those days um, it was so shameful to, to be a bankrupt you'd be imprisoned until you could repay your debts. Now, how, how on earth do you actually repay your debts if you're stuck in prison and can't earn any money to repay your creditors? So people would often die in prison and Dickens represented that beautifully in some of his books. You compare that with the entrepreneurial spirit of, of the US where it's almost a rite of passage to become bankrupt at, bankrupt at least once um, as your ultimate path to success. And uh, I think Trump is a pretty good example of that. Um, so I think, you know, taking that step back, um, we can see how that history informs the current processes that we have in the UK and the US. So in, in the UK, yes, I think it's fair to say that we have a creditor friendly uh, jurisdiction here. But in my opinion, that represents quite a modest goal which is you know, one of salvaging the, um, the assets for the, the benefit of the creditors. Um, so you have a situation where the directors decide that they need to file for insolvency. Upon that happening, they get displaced from their office and, and their duties by an insolvency practitioner who is an accountant, a specially qualified accountant, whose job is to try to run the company as best he can for the purpose of the administration. And because of the difficulty in raising money in an administration, if there are fixed charges already, you can't prime those fixed charge creditors. Um, it's very difficult for the insolvency practitioner to actually achieve the first goal of administration, which is to, to sort of rescue the company. So we're left with very often a situation where the company goes into liquidation or we have a pre-pack administration whereby the assets of the company are sold to the incumbent creditors. Um, so I think that's, that's sort of the, the creditor friendly world that we have traditionally here in the UK. And we'll move on from that shortly when we look at modern influences. But let's compare it now with what we have in the US, which I think we all regard as a very debtor friendly uh, jurisdiction and it's debtor friendly because it's a lofty goal which is to rescue the company as a going concern with the incumbent managers running the company throughout the chapter 11 process and to, to steer it through that process of negotiation with all of the stakeholders and emerge with a, a better company a better balance sheet and a better operational footing and of course in chapter 11. I mean, it's, it's quite an extraordinary thing. You know, we take it for granted that there's dip financing in chapter 11, but you think about the fact that that process allows these directors who have, you know, in, in our mindset, perhaps here in England, who have allowed the company to get into a state of insolvency, to run the process through insolvency and actually borrow money, which can trump the, um, pardon the pun, which can prime the uh, fixed charge creditors albeit with, um, with some uh, protection for them. But it, that is quite an extraordinary concept and one that we have not been able to get our heads around here in the UK, even with our new um, chapter 11 light legislation on the, the statute books um, currently. Um, so I think another pillar of difference between the two is um, the court involvement, the extent of court involvement between the, the UK process and the US process. In the UK, it's very limited. As I said, you know, we've got an insolvency practitioner who is appointed to, to take over the company. And he is cloaked with very generous statutory powers and authority. 
and he um, will run the company as best he can with very limited court input. He, he's entitled to go to court and ask for directions on questions that he has. But um, as, as far as the court's concerned, he just gets on with it. You contrast that with the US approach, and it's a very intense court process, you know, that you'll find the company and the creditors in court at least once a week, and the judge rolls up his sleeves and presides over the negotiation to make sure that it's fair. So all of the credit constituencies in a US Chapter 11 have a very um, big role to play. Contrast here, ironically, our creditor-friendly system, and the creditors have a fairly passive role to play. Um, but as I said, you know, we, we have modernized a little bit because as Pooja mentioned, the common law is, is beautiful in that it does live and breathe and it's influenced by its circumstances. And I think the globalization of the economy and the rush of US investors to uh, the UK and to Europe to put capital to work um, recently in the last decade, decade and a half, has seen us to try to uh, develop some restructuring systems here, which are more sympathetically minded to the American way so that we can appeal to these uh, American investors who we love and want to invest here. So that's seen us develop what we all know as the scheme of arrangement, which is an incredible testament really to the ingenuity of in English lawyers and their resourcefulness because the scheme of arrangement incredibly is born out of a couple of sentences in our Companies Act, which say very glibly, um, a company may uh, come to an arrangement with its creditors and shareholders. And out of those two sentences, we've developed this extraordinary rich jurisprudence of scheme of arrangement law. And it's resulted in countries from all over the world, including the US, coming to the UK to benefit themselves from the scheme of arrangement. We've seen hundreds of billions of dollars wiped off the balance sheets of companies so as to, to right size them. You know, they've been over indebted. The alternative would be liquidation under their their existing laws in their home state, and that's not palatable. So the scheme is, is a wonderful thing. Um, just a couple of other, other things to mention very briefly. In the, in the uh, world of COVID-19, we now have uh, the resurgence of admin light. Now, I, I made the very bold statement that on entering into an administration, the directors are um, exited from their, their duties. Well, in admin light, um, we're seeing a resurgence of the technical ability uh, for the administrator and or the court to uh, um, keep the directors in some sort of power. And it's, it's a process of negotiation. And that's, that's done now because it's seen as being no blame attributable to the directors. We want to be able to put in place a system to sort of hold the ring until this um, you know, liquidity crisis goes away and things can become normal again. So we cloak the company in a moratorium with the benefit of an insolvency practitioner and with the directors still steering the ship. So that, that's a wonderful thing. Um, briefly, just to mention Europe, um, you know, Europe's not, not the United States of Europe. There is not one federal insolvency law in Europe, as we all know, it's a, a bunch of disparate uh, insolvency laws, which sort of overhangs with the, the cross-border um, framework of the European insolvency regulation, but you'll see different cultural concerns in different European countries, which will baffle American investors. They're, they're getting accustomed to it now, but I remember telling um, one US, US investor that it was not possible to, um, to cram down employees. Employees are considered sacrosanct in France. So, you know, you, you need to be mindful of these, these cultural differences because they're, they're very real and, um, and influence whether or not a restructuring can be done. Thanks, Sonia, that's, that's very useful. Um, I should just say that, you know, certainly from the perspective of the former Commonwealth countries, you know, we've sort of tended to export English common law, you know, as a starting point and then sort of put in a patchwork of changes uh, that we then adapted to our restructuring and insolvency ecosystem. So that's had its own cultural um, sort of implications as well. But I think we'll touch upon that uh, later on in the panel as well. If I could ask uh, Rebecca to step in, so I was trying to find you on the screen. 
you're obviously no. sitting offshore, uh, Rebecca, in that wonderful tropical location. Um, yes, no, we, we were told to share our location, so I, I apologise if, uh, if it's making people envious, but I think the, the thing that Cayman's most known for outside of being a financial centre, which I'll come on to, is Seven Mile Beach. So that is Seven Mile Beach. Um, sort of building on what Sonia said and also um, Pooja just now, the Cayman Islands is a British overseas territory. So it won't surprise people to know that um, its um, legislation and common law does um, springboard off um, the English system, as we'll see as we go into this. Um, and I think informing Cayman's culture is the fact that it's the fifth largest financial centre in the world even though the main island Grand Cayman is about 24 miles long and at its widest part about two miles wide so pretty amazing feat for such a small island and it's also known as the hedge funds capital of the world. Um, prior to 2009 it had really a hybrid legal system because it had its own legislation um, but it still relied on the English insolvency rules, which were not really fit for purpose because the two didn't marry up in, in every way. But since 2009, it's had its own legislation and rules. And if you were to look at them, you'll find similar, both similarities and differences with the um, English um, Insolvency Act and rules. And like the UK, it is a creditor-friendly jurisdiction because a major part of its business is its investment funds and its structured vehicles. And so it's a fundamental principle of um, Cayman insolvencies and restructurings um, that the pari passu treatment of creditors is upheld. So generally unsecured creditors will share equally in the assets of the insolvent entity that are available for distribution. And this is underpinned by the range of clawback claims um, in the company's law, um, which uh, part five sets out the insolvency regime. And they're designed to protect and give effect to that principle um, and ensure that the assets are preserved and made available for unsecured creditors. Um, we have a sophisticated court system um, supported by highly skilled and experienced lawyers. Um, those lawyers will come from um, England and from many English common law jurisdictions. And we have a stable political regime, which we'll see when we go on to um, look at some of the other topics that Pooja's highlighted does influence um, uh, how we do business here. And our economic environment is um, also stable, um, COVID-19 accepted, which I, you know, poses challenges for us all going forwards. I think it's important to note that our highest court of appeal is the Privy Council, um, and that is essentially comprised of the same judges that sit on the highest court of appeal in England, which is um, the Supreme Court. And so they have similar qualifications and experiences to the UK judges. And we're, we're financially backed by the UK as a British overseas territory, which um, obviously dovetails into the stable um, political um, and economic environment. I think one of the unique things about Cayman is the majority of our companies that end up being um, the subject of restructurings carry on business outside the jurisdiction. So the cultural impact that you see in other jurisdictions is not necessarily as visible because our restructurings are predominantly cross-border, so we're very used to having to grapple with and deal with the competing um, legal and political regimes of other jurisdictions. So Cayman doesn't really have a culture in that respect that overlays those. It's, it's more um, neutral, I would say, when it comes to looking at those. This also means that the Cayman Court is very adapt to dealing with cross-border insolvencies, and they've, we actually have built into our legislation, our liquidators looking at whether we en they enter into cross-border protocols if there are other office holders in other jurisdictions. Unlike the UK, um, our office holders are qualified insolvency practitioners, typically accountants, although um, lawyers can also take up that mantle provided they have the appropriate um, qualifications, but most lawyers 
um, seem to choose not to. Um, we don't have, we, we have more of a hands-on approach to our restructurings, unlike the English administrations, um, and probably a little bit more similar to the chapter 11. I know when I first came to Cayman, uh, getting on for 11 years ago now, I felt like um, the court's intervention was more like the UK back in the late 80s, early 90s when I first qualified. So the court does retain a, a pretty um, hands-on hands approach and does require periodic reporting to it and it will oversee key decision making by, um, by the liquidators. Um, I think in terms of um, the restructurings here, it's mainly been um, balance sheet restructurings of global companies, especially you've seen uh, more recently in the oil and gas industry. And I'm sure that many of you will be familiar with the ocean rig restructuring, which was pretty groundbreaking for Cayman. Um, like the UK, we have schemes of arrangement and our bank of case law uh, very much um, embraces the development of the scheme of arrangement um, in the UK. And we have followed a lot of cases there so meaning that we do have that flexible tool but because we don't have the administration regime and because schemes of arrangement sit outside um, of insolvency it's not an insolvency regime it's just been used um, uh, to restructure companies we use um, soft or light touch um, provisional liquidations which mean the directors do retain some control but you do have provisional liquidators appointed by the company who oversee and help implement either the restructuring or a compromise um, with um, creditors. Um, because liquidation is synonymous with um, an insolvency process being terminal, it's taken some time for Cayman to educate certain jurisdictions about the use of provisional liquidations. And I know fairly early on in the game, the Chinese found it very difficult to get their heads around the concept of a liquidation process um, being used for um, trying to um, ensure that a company or group of companies survives. But that education has been pretty successful. Um, Cayman though has um, recognized that and there is currently a, uh, some revised legislation which changes all that um, and provides for a proper restructuring regime with a chief restructuring officer and all the language which we'll come on to that other jurisdictions find is more synonymous with restructuring and we're hoping that that will come into um, onto our statute books in late summer early autumn um, but the Cayman Islands is grappling with other things um, first but does recognize that this is important. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. That's very interesting uh, to hear how, you know, something that started off with the base in English law uh, principles has then sort of developed in a, you know, a cultural context, so to speak. Um, so over to Smitha in Singapore, which obviously as another a former Commonwealth jurisdiction has its own sort of similar history of evolution as well. So, I mean, it's interesting to say history because we are, unlike the others, we're only like 50 plus years old. And in Singapore, I think the main thing about us is that we don't believe in reinventing the wheel. So we look at what everyone else has done and we pick what works and we dump what doesn't. And then we come up with our own weird Frankenstein. And the problem with that is because we don't have a big body of case law that's built up and we sort of graft together, we started off as a common law regime. I mean, that's a basic base of our all our laws but then we've grafted on to the uk schemes of arrangement uh, chapter 11 type concepts and the difficulty with that for us sometimes is when we look at the case law in all the various jurisdictions the law is developed differently from our frankenstein monster so it makes it quite challenging but the main thing for us is um we it's very easy for us to fix things in the system so we don't have the problem of a big body of laws that needs to be um made coherent our ministry of law can parliament can change legislation really fast for us it can be done overnight and you know we are a very stable economy in the sense that we've had the same government since um since independence and so when we need to change something it happens really fast so once we saw that um uh, our UK, 
sorry. Hi. So once you realize that the UK schemes alone weren't enough, um, we needed moratoriums, we needed uh, rescue financing and also other features, we just sort of kind of pieced that in and chucked out whatever else didn't fit with that. But still, we're quite traditional being a very Asian country, so bankruptcy still has the stigma. Uh, I mean, as Sonia put it, the debtor's goal idea from Dickens, we have that kind of concept. It's more of losing face, which is a very Asian thing. So bankruptcy still is a, has got a bad smell. But policy-wise, we're trying to change that because uh, we want to be uh, have an ecosystem that supports rehabilitation. So that's where we are now. Thanks, Smitha. Um, speaking of grafting, you know, just briefly wanted to mention India as well, which is a, an example of where the government tried to implement a cultural mindset shift through legislation. Uh, and it just meant that the law was sort of fought tooth and nail. So while it has sort of brought about that mindset shift, it's just had a lot of casualties along the way. And, uh, you know, changing the law in India is not as easy as it is in Singapore. So just an example of how challenging these issues are in practice. Um, I'll then move on uh, to Kathleen. Um, Kathleen, you're in Johannesburg, heart of Africa. What's it like over there? Well, what I would say is uh, my job is made easier here by saying it's all of the above. So everything that my esteemed colleagues, panelists have said would equally apply to this large continent that is called Africa. Um, you know, I have a very um, boring backdrop because, you know, obviously when you talk about culture in, in a big continent like Africa, uh, encompassing more than 50 countries, um, you know, it's hard to choose an appropriate backdrop. Um, culture is just so rich and, and diverse. So when you're looking at over 50 countries, you have to also look at the history of these countries and when the old world uh, came and first discovered Africa and have left their imprint. So we basically have large categories of legal systems that you can probably summarize um, in, in sort of three or four main, main veins. Um, you have the countries that, um, given their, their French uh, history, the Ohara countries like Côte d'Ivoire, Senegal, um, who have adopted more of a French Napoleonic uh, tradition. Um, and so when it comes to insolvency regimes, you know, it's still very much informed by by, by the, the, the old legal systems with workers' rights being at the, the heart of it. Um, you also have countries uh, that uh, are still fo following or at the base of their, their laws are Roman Germanic. Uh, that is true for Namibia um, and Angola, for example. Um, you also have countries um, that at its base has a mix of Roman Dutch law with strong English common law influence. And that is certainly true uh, where I am based in, in South Africa. So in South Africa, there is um, a, um, a, a rescue uh, regime that is, that is available called the business rescue, um, which enables corporates um, to resurrect um, and it is an alternative to liquidation. And one of the most famous recent business rescue cases uh, is South African uh, Airways. Um, so uh, SAA has gone into formal uh, business rescue proceedings. It's grabbing all the headlines because um, it just shows how challenging it is actually, uh, particularly when you are looking at a state owned uh, enterprise with uh, other considerations uh, behind it, you know, keeping jobs and also at the end of the day, keeping Southern Africa connected to the rest of the world uh, with uh, Johannesburg being an international uh, hub uh, flight connector, although these days no one's really flying anywhere. Um, so what's interesting about this whole diverse, rich mix of culture in, in Africa is that those who have um, uh, experience in, uh, say, the English um, uh, insolvency uh, market um, can actually uh, provide some experience and draw from uh, the uh, applications of laws in England uh, to, to also predict how uh, a certain case might end up in, in Africa. So uh, recently in a, in a default situation in Kenya, 
Um, Kenya is one of those countries in Africa that has decided to revamp its insolvency laws more recently post-independence. Um, and so we're dealing with the Insolvency Act 2015. And uh, if you speak to local council there, they will say often, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty and elements that are unclear about the new law. But because it, we have um, uh, polls, uh, quite a lot of this from the English Administration Act, then let's go to England and see how uh, certain provisions have been applied. And so as an English uh, solicitor, it's helpful to be able to draw from the English experience to predict the future in, in, in a way. So that, that's quite an interesting aspect of what we do in Africa. Great, thank you, Kathleen. That's, that's very, very informative. Um, I'm actually gonna use that reasoning as well. The reason I have a blank background because Asia is just too heterogeneous. Um, so I think, you know, speaking of heterogeneous, Japan is case in point. You can't sort of talk about Asia generally in, in a very easy way. And Japan is, you know, unique in itself in many different ways. So over to you, Yuri. Uh, thank you, Pooja. So as you mentioned, uh, Japan is uh, a unique country uh, the, you can imagine from the Japanese traditional culture, like Japanese temples, Japanese food, uh, Japanese traditional fashion, like kimono. So Japan is the island, uh, long isolated from the Western uh, culture and uh, has developed uh, the unique culture. Uh, so even uh, unique from the other Asian uh, countries, so I can uh, talk about a lot about how unique uh, the insolvency regime as well in Japan. However, uh, I would like to quickly uh, or, or briefly introduce the features of Japanese uh, re restructuring and insolvency regime because I don't want to uh, so, uh, spend a lot of time here. Uh, so we have a lot of topics. So first of all, uh, in Japan, restructuring is very much still considered as an absolute last resort, unlike in the West, especially in the US, uh, where I understand firms often use this to their strategic advantage. In some sense, restructuring and insolvency paints the management of firms in a negative light and is akin to losing face. In Japan, the restructuring and insolvency system is similar to chapter 11. We have two uh, restructuring proceedings that is civil rehabilitation proceedings and corporate re uh, reorganization proceedings. Uh, both uh, procedures are similar to chapter 11. In Japan, uh, however, uh, different from chapter 11, there are no strong creditor committees and the level of disclosure is often criticized from creditors abroad. In addition, we need to mention that our uh, Japanese traditional financing system, uh, we call the main bank system. Uh, that is in a sense, a creditor friendly system, which allows the main bank to exert an extraordinary amount of influence over its clientele due to their usually long and tight relationship. Okay, thank you, Yuri, that's, that's very helpful. Um, again, as we've heard from all our panelists, you know, I think every jurisdiction has sort of adopted its own solution, either because of historical reasons or by deliberate adaptation to respond to the different cultural nuances. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to Mia to take over the next panel theme. Yes, thank you, Pooja. I mean, that was really, really interesting. And I think just on that particular um, theme alone, we could have really much done, could have carried on for another hour or two. Um, but just moving on in terms of really understanding some of those cultural issues, um, we really wanted to sort of, you know, examine um, how... Uh, cultural dynamics play in relation to deal making and restructuring specifically 
um, and whether some of the typical stereotypes that we've probably all come across, whether that be East or West, um, you know, how relevant that is to, trans, uh, to, to, to restructuring. Um, and we know we've all been in a room with, you know, a bunch of guys or girls from, you know, the US on, um, you know, style and, and other uh, hedge funds uh, involved in transactions and some of the cultural issues around that on cross-border transactions. Um, we have a question actually, which I'd like to have another go at. Um, <laughs> um, so could you please answer this, yes or no? Do cultural considerations have an impact on the success of direct? Uh, easy answer. <laughs> so yes, 100% looks like a yes. Okay, moving on. So um, let, in terms of uh, what I'd like to do now is ask each panelist the following question, starting with Smither. So in your experience, you know, in terms of the various sort of typical stereotypes when we look at East and West culturals, um, have these stereotypes affected the success of your deal? Uh, yes, I think generally in Asia, you've heard Yuri mentioned this and I think Pooja mentioned this as well. We have this concept of face and that drives a lot of our, that drives a lot of how we approach deal making. So for example, when it comes to entering into a contract or entering into a business relationship, the objective of the counterparty may be to close the contract. But for Asians, it's really about more, the, it's more important for us to procure the business relationship. So we can give and take on the contract at hand when the, the more important thing for us is, okay, if I do this now, am I going to make life difficult for myself in establishing a good relationship with this person? So in terms of goals towards deal making, it's very much relationship driven over you know, specific contract. And linked to that is this idea that um, you shouldn't lose when you win. So uh, we don't like to, it's important that everyone walks away. As we don't restructuring, no one walks away happy, right? Everyone just walks away with what they can live with. And for us, it's particularly important that we make sure that you don't win completely so that you don't make anyone else at the table lose face. I mean, you're very aware of the fact that they need to go back and bring something back home with them. And so that drives a lot of our motivations when it comes to negotiating a deal or restructuring. And I mean, the, I think the other thing that I've noticed comes up quite a lot, even though it's a very strong stereotype, it's the hierarchy that's involved in communication and deal making. So at the I mean, just at the very outset, I see like, um, you'll see funds send, if they're an American fund, for example, they'll send someone junior when they know they're going to be meeting like the CEO of a Japanese company. I mean, like to, to us, this is just a no-no. Uh, it's really important for us that uh, the people, the decision makers are matched because in Asia, decision making is not necessarily uh, spread out. It could be centralized, it could be extremely bureaucratic and when you go into a room, it's really important to know whether you're just really dealing with people who don't have any decision-making powers because they've been just wasting your time. And um, that I see that happening a lot because people don't send the right people to the meetings or at least the first meeting. So that's one thing that I see come up over and over again. The other thing I see a lot is um, you see at these creditors meetings and everything, there's a big disconnect when it comes to communication. I've noticed that for Asians, we don't really like to disagree with you directly. So if someone says something and you don't say anything else, it doesn't mean that you agree with that position. It just means that it's too polite to correct that person in the room. But I see how after, um, after the meeting, you go off and then you see these drafts being exchanged and then the shock and horror from like the party that was talking and directing the meeting saying, but I said all this and no one said anything. So why are you sending back my drafts and saying no to everything? Did we not, were we not in the same meeting? So that keeps coming up over and over again. And um, I was reminded of this when I read Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers, when they were talking about the Korean air crashes in the 90s. And his theory was that it was very much tied to the Korean language and culture where in Korean, in Korean and I, I studied a bit of Korean, which is why I understand this example. In Korean, you don't, um, it's very hard for you to correct or challenge the judgment of someone who's older than you. The, the, there aren't words, the vocabulary doesn't lend itself to it. So you can't tell, the junior pilot can't tell the senior pilot, uh, you're gonna crash 
all you can do is, oh, you know, senior, um, would you like to look at, you know, out of the window and see, you know, that big thing that's flying towards us? And by that time, it's too late. So the, and, and I mean, Malcolm Gladwell, he drew a lot of support for his theory by saying that, by pointing out that when they switched the language of the cockpit to English, which doesn't have these nuances of hierarchy and communication, uh, the safety record improved. So I don't know whether that's true or not in real life, but I did find that, I do notice when I speak to Koreans, you can't actually correct someone senior. That just aren't words that you, the vocabulary isn't meant to it. So like that in communication, um, that comes up a lot in Asian deal making. Okay, Smitha, that's uh, very, very interesting. Um, and I know that we are a little bit pressed for time, guys, so I'm going to try and sort of move on fairly quickly here. So, Rebecca, could you share with us any uh, interesting insights in relation to this piece? Yeah, I think picking up on, on what Smith has just said, I think it's inevitable that there are cultural jurisdictions. I think every jurisdiction to a greater or lesser extent will have insolvency legislation, which at, at its heart will lie the protection of its own or balancing the protection of its own domestic business. So this always has to be borne in mind, but the degree to which cultural differences affect a, su a successful restructuring depends on you know, factors we've already highlighted, your political regime, is it stable or not, the degree of influence there, whether you have a sophisticated court system and a, a tried and tested restructuring regime. And as I've already said, came and what it protects its business funds and structured vehicles. So key policy decisions in and around its legislation does have one eye on that, but it also acknowledges that most of its business has a very international um, nature. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, in the essence of time, one of the things I do want to pick up on is, um, being aware of these differences, I know Smita just highlighted um, Korea, we actually have an intranet page devoted to cultural differences in each of the countries. And it is true, you know, I think you see, I see more clashes between um, uh, Asian negotiators in the US in terms of the US style is, um, it's formal to start off with, but they get in there, they roll their, their sleeves up and, you know, they're very forwards in telling you um, what their position is. And there's not a lot of listening that goes on. There's not a lot of stepping back, checking that their counterparts actually understand what's being proposed, have the ability to ask questions. And so um, the the issues that Smeet has just highlighted, you know, do actually happen because you then have your counterpart walking away saying, oh, I actually don't agree to that, but they haven't necessarily spoken up in the meeting because culturally they haven't really been given the opportunity to do so. I also think we're always divided by a common language. And one of the things that I am, uh, have drilled into me time and time again is, you know, avoid using jargon, speak clearly, use words, try not, you know, instead of using enormous or tremendous, just use big, try and simplify your language. That way you're ensuring that when you're actually in these rooms and you're negotiating, you know, very important um, provisions of a restructuring, everyone is on the same page. Um, I just very quickly had a, have a situation that's just resolved where oil and gas company, um, because the US advisors had really looked at the set off, netting off of intercompany liabilities, they thought they'd compromise that whole situation. The, the original parent company had been hived off and put into a Cayman liquidation with the, the redundant companies underneath it. And because they hadn't looked at it from a Cayman perspective, there was a whole intercompany position of about $100 million that the new parent was facing having to pay. And we had to find very creative solutions to resolve that, they ended up paying 15 million. But that's an example of not really being aware of how things impact in the different jurisdictions, both culturally and legally. So I'll, I'll leave it there because of uh, time. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Rebecca. Sonia, I think you had a couple of insights as well. 
Yeah, okay, just, just a couple of points, um, given the time. Just responding to a point that Smitha made about people needing to walk away with something. I think in the UK, it's quite different because we follow the, the counterfactual. What would the counterfactual to the restructuring be if, if you're in a restructuring process like a scheme of arrangement? Well, very often the counterfactual would be, say, a liquidation. And so um, the, the waterfall uh, would, would therefore follow um, the restructuring. And so a process of valuation occurs. And if you fall below the, the waterline where the value breaks, uh, you don't get a say in the restructuring. In fact, you won't even be asked to, to vote on the restructuring. Now, that's not necessarily to say that you won't get anything because there may be other factors aside from value break to determine that you know, your um, role is still required in the post restructured um, vehicle. But um, the point of reference is quite clear in, in terms of actual rights. Um, and the, the other point I just wanted to make very quickly was uh, these, these cultural differences that we've all been talking about have been well recognized by practitioners worldwide and hence the uh, development of UNCITRAL's model law on cross-border restructuring and the continued work of UNCITRAL to, to continue honing um, these, these laws for us to, to help provide a framework for, for recognizing the differences and and for granting relief in a, in a coordinated way. Likewise, um, INSOL's um, principles of cross-border restructuring. Um, finally, um, I think it's interesting that even if a country has implemented the, the model law word for word, there's still wide scope for, for different interpretation. You look at the, the US chapter, 11, uh, chapter 15 um, implementation of the model law and under chapter 15, they will recognize and enforce a plan of reorganization uh, of a foreign um, jurisdiction, even if it compromises New York law debt. Contrast that with the UK uh, in our cross-border insolvency regulation, which is our adaptation of um, the model law, we will not um, be likely to recognize and implement a foreign plan of reorganization if it purports to uh, amend English law debt. And that, that's because of a a very old rule of English law called the rule in Gibbs. That, that's all I wanted to say. Okay, so I mean, given um, what's been sort of come, come out on this, this particular um, part of the panel, I mean, certainly culture is, is an area that cannot be understated in relation to negotiation. Um, and if anything, I quite like Rebecca's um, firm's idea about dedicating uh, you know, internet to cultures, because obviously it does play such an important part. On that note, I'm going to hand back to Pooja. Thanks, Mia. Um, so, you know, I'd like to explore, um, in light of the past discussion, some specific case studies around how cultural dynamics have influenced negotiations in two unique jurisdictions, um, Africa and, and then um, Japan. But before that, if I could get Shari's help to run a quick poll, how many of you have committed a cultural faux pas in a client situation? Be honest, you're in a safe space. Okay, 100%. Oh no, 63%. Wow, we have some very culturally astute folks in the audience. Um, right, so um, let's start with Africa and Kathleen. Hi, th thanks very much. Um, just looking at some practical examples of what happens uh, on the ground in Africa and how culture just seeps in. Um, in many cases, in cross-border situations in Africa, we would be looking in a private, in the private sector, private companies, often what we'd be dealing with is a conglomerate uh, that is ultimately held by a certain individual, um, so to say, uh, often a man, um, who has done very well for himself and his family um, and is uh, prosperous and well-connected. And it's not um, a coincidence uh, that when the stress hits uh, in, in a corporate group like this, um, that there are also um, political uh, considerations as well. Um, in that, um, you know, if the business has become very successful all the, over the years, um, 
most of the time it's because um, you know the business knows how to navigate the local landscape and has got the uh, approval and support of local government uh, to succeed. And so when distress hits, then um, it's not necessarily good for the individual, uh, the high net worth individual, and certainly not his family, but it's also not good for the community um, and also the, the, the local government that, that has been supporting that business. So in one case in, in West Africa, um, when the uh, borrower uh, defaulted on the debt, um, there was security, local security in that West African country that was available. Um, and so the creditor, uh, which came from uh, the US, was looking to enforce the local security. Now on paper, the rights were very, very clear. There was non-payment and there was a right to accelerate and take uh, possession of the local um, property under the local security. So in terms of legal rights, very clear. Um, however, when the creditor came on the ground in country to have some discussions with local receivers, uh, just to prepare for enforcement, um, uh, basically, um, the local community got wind of these meetings um, and then that generated uh, into a high level uh, phone call made by, you know, a local uh, government official to uh, the, um, the head of department at the creditor uh, saying, what is this that I hear that you're preparing to enforce? Um, so so there, there are things that do take place um, outside of the legal documentation that one will need to take, uh, take into account. Now the political aspects of it are also particularly important when you're looking at restructuring a state-owned enterprise. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier the SAA South African Airways example, uh, where it's, um, it's, not, it's not only looking at the commercial aspects of what makes sense, but it's also what does it make sense for the country, for government, for the people of South Africa. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, to do a proper restructuring, um, you would need to shed jobs, uh, tens of thousands of jobs. Um, you also have local banks that are exposed to the credit. So, you know, if not properly dealt with, um, it could also have um, impact on the local financial uh, systems and, and local financial institutions as well. So um, I, I would mention that political, social, economic considerations are, are very um, important to, to look at in a restructuring in Africa. Um, and then finally, I just mentioned that with the Belt and Road Initiative, um, that, um, that there, 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 there is a lot of Chinese capital that has come into Africa as part of the Belt and Road Initiative and also outside of that as well. So when the stress hits on the continent here, often than not, um, you will see a Chinese player somewhere in the capital structure. And uh, they can come in um, as a creditor, both public side and private side. Um, they may be the construction uh, party in the projects. They could be the equity investor. Um, so wearing those different hats will drive behavior in how in, in, in a restructuring as well. Um, so when you mix the Chinese element with the Africa element, it does make for, for some very interesting case studies. Thanks, Catherine. That's, that's, that's fascinating. And I think politics has had a key role to play in Asia as well. And actually, I think, you know, this sort of framework makes it even more challenging for us as lawyers to advise our client because you can't just, you know, send a memo or enforcement to your client. I think it's incumbent upon you to kind of explain the nuances of the political landscape as well. And that's quite challenging to do. So Yuri, over to you uh, on Japan. Yes, yeah, so I would like to introduce uh, one uh, actual case, uh, the Takata Airbag case. In 2017, I was involved in uh, one of the biggest automotive manufacturing restructuring cases, the Takata Airbag case. At the time of its unfortunate crisis, they were in the second position in both the airbag and seatbelt markets with 24 4% shares and then 
1% shares respectively. So due to some unfortunate incidents, Takata faced a global recall and filed a civil habilitation in Japan, as well as a chapter 11 for its subsidiary in the US. The overall debt Takata faced was in excess of 30 billion US dollars with 15 billion US dollars due to automotive related creditors. Takata transferred substantially all of the assets and businesses owned worldwide by Takata Group to key safety systems in April 2018. So, uh, wait a minute, I would like to share one slide just for your information. I hope it works. Yeah, I think so. So if yeah. you take a close look at the stakeholders map, you can see that there are multiple stakeholders around Takata, such as car OEMs, financial institutions, thought creators, and governments from all over the world. Due to the various nationalities, ethnicities, and jurisdictions involved, the process was extremely convoluted. I was involved in the Takata case as a representative of one of the biggest car OEM creditors. The car OEMs faced serious problems in Takata's restructuring process. The biggest issue was how our client could maintain the stability of its supply chain and manufacturing operations throughout Takata's restructuring and the subsequent sale of Takata's global operations to KSS. In addition, special attention needs to be paid with regards to how to deal with both the US dollars, US dollars uh, 15 billion recall claims in chapter 11 and Japanese civil rehab proceedings. The 15 major car OEMs created a working group which were deeply involved in a numbers of time, uh, times, numbers of time, sensitive negotiations with Takata. A total of 42 OEMs, including these major OEMs, had claims against Takata. More than 50 advisors, such as lawyers, financial advisors, and accountants were retained by the OEMs in the US, in Japan, and EMEA, and so on. Compared to the multinationalities of the OEM, Takata itself was a traditional type Japanese corporation whose founding family controlled 60% of its shares. So as you can easily imagine, the internal decision-making process contained a number of cultural conflicts between the traditional Japanese corporation and the multinational global fund. In the OEM group, it took time for members to get used to the multinationalities, but gradually they deepened their understanding of the cultural differences amongst each other and the different procedures in each jurisdiction. As a result, in my personal view, having the combination of both Western and Japanese creditors in the OEM group led to an ideal outcome because the Japanese or Asian parties worried about consensus building, while the Western parties worked toward speeding up the process. Hence, in my view, the combination of multinational stakeholders can be advantageous for the entire restructuring process if we try our best to understand our diversities and respect each other's differences. Thank you so much, Yuri. That's, that's uh, you know, a really fantastic takeaway. You know, cultural considerations isn't always a bad thing. And you've had a unique uh, ringside view to a cross-border restructuring in Japan that is played out as well. Um, with that, I'll hand back to Mia for the last theme. Thank you, Pooja, um, and another insightful panel uh, theme. 
Um, but again, we could spend another couple of hours talking about. Um, we're literally running out of time, so I'm just going to kind of keep this very, very short. Um, before we get into the, the quick one, there's another question here. Um, the, the theme for this panel was going to be really focusing on communication, but we can't do a panel on culture without talking about gender. So um, have you ever seen someone's gender affect negotiation in any way? Quite interesting. Um, so, you know, I think in terms of, of communication and so on, I mean, gender is obviously a key and, um, you know, obviously that by the judging what I work, there's so many more women now who are in prominent positions in deal making and restructuring and in insolvency that be interesting to do this panel again um, in 12 months time to, to follow up and to see the outcomes of a number of case studies and whether or not um, how successful they've been about those that were done, you know, five, 10 years ago. So I just wanted to sort of really go to all of our panelists before we close. I'll, I'll perhaps have a, a few minutes of questions if people are still able to stay with us um, and just ask them for a, really a final word in relation to any tips they may have um, in successful communication in, in complex restructuring situations. Um, and with that, I will start with my moderator colleague, Pooja. I would just say there's no shortcut to building a personal relationship with your client to be a trusted advisor. If it means getting on that horrible 6.40 a.m. flight to Jakarta to go over documents for days, that's just the only way to really be an effective deal practitioner in this part of the world. Thank you. Smitha. Um, I would just say, uh, be aware of the tendency towards stereotyping. I mean, there's a reason stereotypes are stereotypes, but at the same time, speaking for all the Singaporeans, we're tired of deal makers asking us whether they'll get hung or beaten if they chew gum in Singapore. So <laughs> do a bit of homework. <laughs> that's, that's my suggestion. Okay. That's very wise words, I believe. Um, Kathleen, can I come to you next, please? Sure. I would just say, I mean, obviously we're all each individual, so we bring our own self into whatever situation we're advising on. Um, and, um, and um, you know, we draw from our own cultural experiences. And some of us, you know, like me, I'm, I'm not South African. I was born in Canada of Chinese origin, having worked uh, in Asia, Europe, and, and now Africa. So I bring all of me into uh, my deals. And what I say is I come with an open mind. I come in peace um, and I draw from, from my different experiences. Thank you, thank you. Yuri, please share with us any, anything you have. Yeah, uh, my view is similar to my takeaways from Takata case. So even though it takes time, but we always need to uh, not to forget to uh, respect the diversities and then differences. So I, I think that the, all the time uh, the key and then that's the basic. Okay. Um, Rebecca. Um, all, of, all of the above. I mean, ensuring you have good contacts. I think being a member of iWork, as, as this has demonstrated, is an excellent place to start. I think for me really it is rem remembering to be a good listener and respecting the cultural differences, making sure you're aware of them before you go into the negotiations, um, even though they may be differences that don't sit well with you, you need to appreciate that they do have a serious impact on the outcome of any successful negotiation. Thank you, that's, that's absolutely true. Sonia, you finally, last word on this. Well, all of the above really resonates with me. And I, I, I'd really like to echo what Kathleen said, you know, bringing yourself to the party because um, I'll just bring Oscar Wilde in here. He said, be yourself because everyone else is taken. So I think uh, there's some food for thought there. Absolutely. Well, I mean, as I say, it's been a fantastic um, panel. So, you know, throughout here, we, I don't say, I think we could have gone on for some time um, really kind of examining these topics. So we have tried to rush through this to not take up too much more time. 
Um, but I feel that there will be several follow on sessions um, coming up um, when there's certainly some interesting themes here. Um, so if we probably have got time for one or two questions, um, so please feel free if you have them to raise your hand if you know how to do that and we will do our best to answer them. Uh, it looks like George uh, Kalakos has a question, uh, had raised his hand. So I will unmute him. Okay. Hi, George. Hey, George. Uh, hi, first of all, I want to say that this is the best, absolutely the best uh, program, virtual program that I've seen so far, and I've seen a bunch of them. Number two, I have to say that, of course, insult, but specifically I work. You are very, um, it's from, your, uh, from your comments, you're right on the, on the money. I've been fighting this. Well, I'm not a typical American, as Sherry knows. I mean, I grew up overseas. Um, my practice is 100% cross-border, and I spent a lot of time in different jurisdictions. I'm sitting here in Malaysia right now. So, you know, the way I, one of the things I would suggest for the future, you've brought it down to this level, and that's wonderful. You know what's fun? We did something fun at III, and I think this would be a great program that you could do virtually is um, almost like little skits. Think about coming down a little bit, demonstrating what you don't do and what you do. So we had a little, we had an interesting skit where without getting into details, we had sort of a New York approach versus uh, a judge ringing a little, a little, uh, you know, a little triangle and then resetting, showing how maybe a different approach might be necessary. I run into stuff all the time out here. And one of the keys, I'll make a suggestion, you know, uh, I have people that know me, I've been doing martial arts for 51 years. And one of the things that I tell people is I do, I take lessons from my martial arts, particularly tushu, push hands. You know, you don't always have to be young. You can be yin. Listen, work on your listening skills, work on your stillness, work on your awareness of body language. Of course, you must le learn to use, um, uh, you know, to, to, to develop those skills and also rely on people such as the panelists here and, and many of the people that are participating. Rely on your local people, lead with them. You don't have to have an ego trip and lead in the negotiations. I don't. Stop that a long time ago. So be a little bit more yin. And that's a hint, hint, hint for the guys. Be a little more yin. You'd be surprised uh, wh wh where it gets you. That's it. That is an excellent point, George. Thank you very, very much. Any other questions, Sherry? I uh, don't, not that okay. I think. Well, I'd just really like to say again, and I, I'm not, obviously we, we can show our appreciation by, by clapping, but I think this has been a thank you so much to um, everybody involved in the panel. Pooja, who's did a huge amount of hard work to get this to, um, to your viewing. Um, my first Zoom panel so um, I'm glad that we, we managed to get through that without any main issues and of course thank you to Insol and specifically to iWork. Um, this certainly demonstrates the benefit of iWork bringing us all together and it's lovely to see a number of friendly faces on the screen as well. So thank you all very much and um, hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Bye. Thanks, guys.